Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our online program at the Canix Institute. I'm Laura Shepard, Director of Events, and I'm very pleased to welcome Evelyn McDonald for a conversation about her new book, The World According to Joan Didion, which is an intimate exploration of the life, craft, and legacy of one of the most respected and significant writers of our time. Before we begin, if you're new to the Mechanics Institute, we were founded in 1854 and were one of San Francisco's most vital literary and cultural centers in the heart of the city. Mechanics Institute features our general interest library, an international chess club, ongoing author and literary events, and on Friday, our cinema lit film series. But please visit our website at milibrary.org to learn more about our programs and all that we have to offer you. If you're in San Francisco, please join us for a tour of the Institute and our very beautiful Beaux-Arts building here at 57 Post Street, uh, Wednesday at noon. Once again, Wednesday at noon for the free tour. Our discussion tonight will be followed by a Q&A with you, our audience. So please put your questions in the chat or on the Q&A and we'll be reading those questions out uh, to our guest. In her new book, Evelyn McDonald takes us along as she talks about those who knew Didion and who also inspired her. We travel with her to the places where Didion lived and documented as she digs through the archives and as we take this deep dive into her writing, her themes, her styles, her characters. Her new book, The World According to Joan Didion, is a meditation on the people, settings, and objects that propel Didion's prose, and is it also an invitation to journalists, storytellers, and all life adventurers to throw themselves into the convulsions of the world as Didion once said. Evelyn McDonald has written three, has written or co-edited several books, including Women Who Rock, Bessie to Beyonce, Girl Groups to Riot Girls, and Queens of Noise, the real story of the Runaways. She has been a pop culture writer at the Miami Herald and a senior editor at the Village Voice. Her writings have appeared in anthologies and publications, including the New York Times, The Guardian, Los Angeles Times, Ms., and Billboard and others. And she also teaches journalism at Loyola Marymount University and lives in San Pedro, California. So we're thrilled to have you here with us, Evelyn. This is just such an honor uh, to welcome you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you so much for having me. I hope to. Um, come in person in some future date and uh, see. I can't believe how long the Mechanics Institute has been around and I have not been in it yet. So I look forward to uh, that somewhere down the line. Great. And it's also a great place to research if you spend some time here in San Francisco. We have a, we have a great library for research. And uh, oh. so we, we certainly great. invite you. Um, you know, before we begin, I just want to give you a little sense of our connection with Joan Didion. You know, we to have Joan here at Mechanics Institute for her book tour, The Year of Magical Thinking. And we think it was either 2005 or 2006. And she arrived in her quiet, undisturbed demeanor of very few words, a sort of call of grief and mourning due to the recent loss of her husband and daughter imbued even the weight of her coat, and she did not take off her sunglasses. This was the privacy she needed at this most public and tender time, but her generosity with her audience was apparent, and she graciously engaged with each reader and signed every book. And for me, this signaled a very special moment of literary sacred space. So we were 
very honored to also have this engagement with Joan Didion. It was it was a very special a special time and a special a special engagement with with our audiences and with with Mechanics Institute. So we sort of just wanted to set the scene that yeah. we had a brief connection with her. That's um, a great that's a great anecdote and and just you know she didn't take her sunglasses off at her wedding either. So um, that was a thing. <laughs> she was known for those, those big sunglasses. Um, but I, and I do think it was a way of her of maintaining privacy and um, hiding her emotional register. Which... And by then she was such a public figure. And after these experiences, these traumas that she went through, um, you can certainly understand the importance. But just jumping right in with you, Evelyn, I mean, so, you know, from your background writing about rock and roll and contemporary culture. Um, why and when did you sort of move towards writing about Joan Didion? Um, you know, were you always a fan? And how did this differ from the prior writing and research that you had done? Right. So, yeah. So my origin story is um, like a lot of people's origin story. I discovered her in, in college. Um, which is part of why I teach her now to to my students at, at LMU. Um, I read um, some Dreamers of the Golden Dream in the new journalism anthology edited by Tom Wolf. I was taking a journalism course, and you know, along with other selections in that that book, um, it really opened my mind to the possibilities of what could be done in the journalistic form to to ways of 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 writing of bringing in point of view techniques and um, and and just having beautiful writing be part of what happens with journalism. Um, so, and I, I think I just absorbed that and um, went on to read other works by her, uh, mostly her, mostly her journalism and essays, mostly her, her narrative and nonfiction, um, which, you know, I do think was her, what she did best, the essays. Um, books like The Year of Magical Thinking. Um, and, you know, was always a fan, but not, she wasn't somebody that I really wrote about. She was someone that I read and that I, I taught as soon as I taught. Um, but I did, you know, mostly write about music in my journalism career. Now, my first book was called Rock She Wrote, and it was a collection edited with Ann Powers of writing about music by women. Um, so I do think in a sense, I have come full circle because I am again talking about writers. That book was talking about writers. And, you know, some of, a couple of Joan's more famous pieces were about rock and roll, were her interview with The Doors, um, or not really interview, but her hanging out in the studio with the doors um, and then her story on Joan Baez for the New York Times. And I, and I do think that she was a rock star among writers and, you know, she was very much, she was a huge part of that 1960s counterculture scene. I mean, a, a critic of it, uh, but also someone who was, was immersed in it and who, who documented it. So uh, to me, there's, there's a connection. Um, I've also noticed that a lot of musicians are really inspired by Joan Didion. And that's just something that is emerging more and more. I, I think since her death, a lot of writers have been, I mean, a lot of musicians have been speaking about that. Um, so I, you know, her writing, her, her really great writing, I think is very musical, has a really special rhythm. She talked a lot about, um, how she, her relationship to the grammar. Um, so I, I feel like there's there's a connection there. I mean, the first song on the new Olivia Rodrigo album, Guts, is from a, a Joan Didion essay. The title's from a Joan Didion essay. So she's, uh, which is, you know, 20 year old pop star, perfect album, perfect 10 album declared by Pitchfork Magazine. I saw that today and I agree. Um, so yeah, she's hitting multiple generations still including musicians. Amazing. Um, also, you, you know, you quote her by saying that we are all storytellers 
and that storytellers uh, storytelling is a basic human right, you know, a necessity just like food and water and shelter, and that we tell stories to live. It gives us raison d'etre. It it gives us the parameters of our lives and also the values of our lives. Can you explain and talk more about how this was essential to Joan from her very early days in Sacramento to becoming a famous writer uh, and a serious writer? Right. So, the, you know, it's her very famous uh, quote, we tell ourselves stories in order to live, um, which is, you know, partly a, a, a critique, but it's also true to her her own life that she began writing when she was five years old. And, you know, she, she wrote about this in her essay on keeping a notebook that her mother, um, she was pestering her mother for attention and her mother had a new a child, a young child, uh, Joan's brother, Jim. And she said, you know, I'm, I'm busy. You go, here's the notebook, uh, go busy yourself. And Joan promptly took the notebook um, and went and wrote a short story about, being in uh, the Arctic freezing and then the Sahara dying of heat. Um, very kind of bizarre <laughs> future hints of, of things to come. And you know, she wrote in, in on Keeping a Notebook about how important it was to her to uh, have this record of what she was thinking and that she always carried a notebook um, and that it wasn't a diary. Uh, it was a notebook where she jot, was jotting down what she saw. And I think, and I in my research, I saw some of those notebooks that were part of um, the books that she wrote, that she used them for notes. Um, and I'm sure there's more of those in the archives that are to come. So, and I, I kind of think, like, I, I think that's such an interesting moment because she had such a strong relationship with her mother and, until her mother died. That was a very strong force in her life. Um, and I think that her mother telling her to write as a kind of dismissal, but also a like here, you know, empower yourself by writing it down. I can't listen to it all, but write it down for yourself. Um, it's a great lesson to, to give your child um, at, at that young of age. Uh, and, and she carried it without her through her own life. And, you know, she, Another, you know, one of another thing she said about writing, she talked a lot and wrote a lot about why writing was important to her. Um, and one of the things she says, I write in order to um, understand what I'm thinking, uh, which I think is really powerful. I think I, as a writer, read that and go, yes, absolutely. Like, until I've written it down, sometimes I don't know how to articulate what I want to say. Like, it helps me pull out of my head, this inchoate information and put it down on the page. So I think, it, you know, and it was, and I also, you know, Joan was a a, a small woman, petite, um, quiet, as you said, kind of reserved. And I think writing was her way of having power in the world. And she wielded her pen and her notebook and her, you know, keyboard computer, um, you know, like, like weapons. I mean, she, she made the world listen to her. Yeah, it's really powerful. This this notebook and and what how it it helps her to evolve as a writer. And just getting back to the to the notebook and how we start with our either a diary or notation or a scribble or you know words on a napkin in a bar. Um, uh, can you talk about the structure of this book and how each of the chapters are named with these singular words, gold, notebook, snake, etc. And also to talk about, can you talk about the significance of each of these chapters and symbols um, were to Joan and also for you in, in constructing uh, this, this unusual biography? Absolutely. So, um, so I'll, I'll just show the audience for a minute. This is the book. Oh, it's, it's backwards. I my thing mirrored. Um, and if you open the book, you'll see on the inside cover, there's all these drawings. And it looks like the inside of a composition notebook. Um, so that was definitely a theme that we were trying 
to have in, in homage to on keeping a notebook. Um, and, and these drawings are all by an artist named Ann Munches who um, lives in Brooklyn, who's a really, really wonderful, talented writer. She just some, I mean, artist, she did some drawings for Rock, uh, Women Who Rock, my previous book as well. Um, and so let me just read a passage um, sort of explaining this in the book. Um, and then I'll follow up with that. Just going to read a, a paragraph here. Um, like a notebook, this story proceeds in a fragmented style. As Joan's writing did, it embodies to some degree the atomization she prophesied. It is not a narrative log of events. It is more like an associative legend for a map, with each chapter named after an object that figured large in Didion's imaginary. Gold, snake, hotel, orchid. And therefore, it leaps around and across space and time. Occasionally, I insert myself into the narrative. Joan could be a very informed and partial writer, but one of the keys to her appeal is the way she often personalized her work. For her piece, for life, for her first piece, for Life magazine, she wrote not about the war in Vietnam as she had wanted to. Her editor wouldn't send her because, quote, the guys were already covering it. Instead, she wrote that she was in the Royal Hawaiian Hotel in Honolulu, quote, in lieu of filing for divorce. I tell you this not as aimless revelation, but because I want you to know, as you read me, precisely who I am and where I am and what is on my mind. Um, so Joan was very concrete and detailed in her writing and very observational. That's one of the things that, you know, others have said and that I really found in, in deep diving into her work. Um, and so when I was going through her writing, and this is one of the anthologies we tell ourselves called, we tell ourselves stories in order to live from the quote. Um, so this was sort of, this was easy for me in my travels to carry around and it has uh, her, her first books up, up through where I was from, which I'll talk about later. Um, so as I was reading them, I started marking different themes that I noticed coming up or different recurring motifs, essentially, such as snake very, very famous for how often she wrote about snake um, or flowers. Um, and I would, the snakes are red and I have other books uh, here. I don't want to knock the books over. And so I color coded recurring motifs that um, I also, that were also somewhat time stamped in her life, but, uh, but then ran through it. And so then the, the book itself um, is named after those objects. And oh my goodness, my dog, I think is going to join us. Uh, unfortunately, I might let him in. Um, and so the drawings are so, for instance, there's a chapter girl, which is about Quintana Rudun. Um, and there's the drawing of, of the girl. Um, and then these are all, man is the glasses of John Gregory Dunn, her husband. These are all um, then brought together in, in the end papers. Um, and it was just a way of um, sort of breaking out of, sorry, I'm gonna let my dog in, the chronology, uh, it, it still goes chronologically. It does It does go from her birth to her death. Um, it does, my dog wants to come see. Oh, 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 sorry, Alex. There's my dog, Alex. Okay, now you can go back to your bed, sorry. Um, uh, it, does, it does flow chronologically, but I'm also trying to, I really tried to look, think about the things that mattered to her and why, and and explain how they recurred throughout her writing and her life. Yeah, uh, very. It's it it's they're very powerful symbols, and also they they open up this, these conversations throughout the book. Very very informative, and Thank also you. for those of us who don't know, who haven't you know read all of her writing, which is just this huge volume it kind of grounds us you know in in a foot in these in this particular focus which um is really quite quite informative and really appreciate how you how you put that together um the other thing that is so powerful about her writing or one of the many things is that she moved the readers and also the public view from east to the west um 
especially when she's writing about California, um, the land, the place, people, and the culture. Um, and she also maintained this kind of healthy battle between you know, appreciation and also skepticism of the California dream. So right. I wonder if you could also talk about how she's dealing with, is she accepting the California dream? Is she critical? Is she trying to like shake us and wake us up? Uh, what, what is she trying to portray here and why? Um, and also if you could include a reading. Yes. So she's definitely, you know, trying to always, she's trying to make us um, pay attention to the, the world around us. I mean, that's why it's called the world according to, to Joan Didion, because she, um, she was always observing, she was always writing it down and she was wanting to make us look at the world and, and be critical of um, what we've been told and, you know, and, and uh, the, narratives that um have dominated uh, our understanding of the world around her and she did that in her own life and you know uh if readers if readers if, if uh, our audience doesn't you know know she was born and raised in sacramento california the capital of california uh, in the central valley um and that was very important she said that it shaped everything she ever thought those um, the the farmlands there, the flatlands of the of the valley, the endless you know fields of hops or um, all the produce that's grown there, as well as the Sacramento and the American rivers, and then you know framed by the mountains on on both sides, right, Berkeley Hills, um, and and the Sierra Nevada, uh, and she, that was absolutely, and she was a fifth generation Californian also, right. Her ancestors came in the middle of the 19th century, along with the Mechanics Institute, right? In that, that you know, when California um, became a state and when, you know, someone struck gold and cried Eureka in the Sierra Nevada, right outside of Sacramento, um, employee of jo Joseph Adolf Adolphus Sutter, who set settled Sacramento, um, found gold and everybody came and came with this this promise of of a new land and so she really grew up on those stories of her own family being part of the the California dream the American dream going out west to to make money you know digging for gold but also you know to do other questionable things like um uh you know convert the the native population um so she she loved California. She wrote about it often. Um, some of her, I think, most beautiful writing is about California. People identified her as a California writing. But she really, in, at a very young age, she began to question those narratives um, and to, you know, see that story in, in a different light. Um, and slowly she wrote, wrote about that mostly in speeches um, that she gave to college students um, and, and things that were maybe less in the public eye because she said later that she didn't want to have to really face um, California because while her parents were alive because she knew that what they had told her was wrong, um, that a lot of it was a myth um, and that a, a lot of foundation and, you know, by extension, of course, of the United States you know, it was based on extermination of, of, of the Indians and, you know, searching for gold and developing and, and you know, not really such a beautiful story. Um, let me just read a passage uh, from, from the book uh, where I talk about this um, a little bit more. Uh, it's from, um, I think it's the wrong book. Um, he called it, you know, the wagon wheels narrative that we're taught uh, and it's from the, the chapter as I said called Snake. So a close reading of Didion's work reveals that a prime agenda was to expose the moral bankruptcy of the myth of the golden land and the entire rhetoric of westward expansionism. Her subject was the American empire and that's something that uh, the writer David Reef, the son of Susan Sontag said to me, um, I interviewed him and other people for this book and 
I thought it was just a really brilliant statement. To, you know, her, one of her great subjects was the American empire. It took her years to fully grasp and articulate this in part because she resisted it, especially as long as her pa parents were alive. And this is the quote. I didn't want to figure out California because whatever I figured out would be different from the California my mother and father had told me about, she said in 2006. There are topics, the fate of the Miwok Indians, the exploitation of Mexican immigrants in the fields that are family owned, for instance, that she never did publicly address. But in incremental pieces, speeches, essays, notes, that were then gathered together in 2003, after her parents' death, as where I was from, she clearly and overtly reveals and removes her blinders on her own past. She laments her middle school optimism and deconstructs the fallacies of her own first novel, Run River, about Sacramento, and its perpetuation of frontier myths. She interrogates California narratives written by authors from Josiah Royce to Frank Norris to William Faulkner to Joan Didion. She documents exclusionary institutions from the Bohemian Club to the Spur Posse. Released from her loyalty to her mother, the woman who gave her the tools and instructions to start writing at age five, and to whom she was so deeply bound that she interred Edu Eduin's remains in the same columbarium as her husband, her daughter, and finally herself, Joan Didion lets it all go. And this is a quote from um, where I was from. All of it, the dream of America, the entire enchantment under which I had lived my life. I tell people that Where I Was From is a really important book to understanding Joan Didion because it is her telling it's where she was from and also that she calls it Where I Was From, not Where I Am From. It, you know, her choice of words was so precise and she she chose that tense of the verb um, because she felt alienated from the California that she had been raised on. Yeah. And, you know, we understand that, you know, place is such an important part of her writing. Um, place, say, over character or plot or theme. Um, could you go into more of the importance of place in her writing? I mean, she lived in a dozen of or more locations, some urban, some rural, from, you know, Los Angeles, Malibu to Honolulu to New York. Um, you know, she was a, 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 a West Coast Easterner and an Eastern West Coaster. Um, but could you talk about what these different cities represented to her and also how they fueled her um, or influenced her writing? Right. So she started in, in Sacramento um, and then she went to college. And we I think we sort of talked about Sacramento. Um, she went to college at Berkeley, University of California, uh, Berkeley, and studied English and literature um, and uh, spent time in, in San Francisco. Um, and I'll actually read a little passage about San Francisco in a, in a minute, but I'll finish sort of the narrative. Um, and one of the, you know, joys of researching this book was that I did retrace a lot of her steps. I did go to a lot of the places that she had been. Um, they also were places that I had lived, some of them. Um, she, uh, after college, she went to New York City, to Manhattan, um, and, uh, initially, she during college she spent a summer in Manhattan working for Mademoiselle magazine in a special program for for students, and then she went back and um, she won the Prix de Paris from Vogue magazine, and um, instead of taking the prize of going to Paris, which they, was what they were offering or money, um, she convinced them to hire her, uh, which is pretty um, interesting, <laughs> um, and so she. I went to New York and was um, in New York until for eight years, until 1964, um, you know, working her way into the publishing industry, um, you know, very ghettoized, writing for women's magazines, but but did have some breakthroughs, um, wrote for the National Review, wrote for William Buckley's magazine. And, you know, she she was at that time um, still fairly conservative. Her parents were very conservative and um, she 
came out of that. And as I said, she slowly transformed and, you know, she may, she, she was writing book reviews for William Buckley. She wasn't really writing. Of course there was politics in them. Um, and, you know, and he was one of the few editors that was willing to hire her as a woman. Um, she wrote beautifully about New York. One of my favorite essays of hers is called Goodbye to All, All That, which starts as a love song to New York and ends up being a farewell. And she and her new husband, John Gregory Dunn, the writer, moved back to California. Um, he was he was from Connecticut, so it was new for him. He wanted to experience it. And it's interesting that he, you know, followed his wife, in a sense, back to California. But they didn't go to Sacramento. Um, they went to Los Angeles. And here they lived in a series of, you know, pretty fabulous places, um, starting with, with Portuguese Bend, which is actually very close to where I live here in, in San Pedro. Um, beautiful house overlooking the ocean. Uh, to um, and then to uh, Hollywood, and they had uh, rented a kind of rundown mansion there, um, uh, and that's where they had parties where Janis Joplin would would show up, and that's when she really wrote a lot about Hollywood. And they were writing screenplays; they were breaking into Hollywood themselves. They um, were doing some production, and um, then they moved to Malibu. Uh, which was, an, again, another beautiful oceanside home in, in Troncos and North Malibu, kind of far from L.A. And that's, you know, you see a lot of pictures from her there. That's when she was very, really starting her um, to be very famous. Uh, TV crews would come and interview her there. Um, she'd be photographed there a lot. Then they moved to Brentwood, very posh part of Los Angeles, um, in part so their daughter could go to high school in L.A. Um, and they had a beautiful house there. And then um, they moved back to New York. Uh, John, uh, her husband was having heart issues and Quintana, their daughter um, was going to Columbia and then working in the publishing industry. And they went back to the, the Upper East Side and that's where she lived the last decades of, of her life. Um, she also spent a lot of time in Hawaii. This was something um, that appealed to her from a child that she would you know look across the pacific ocean and a man she wrote about imagining hawaii out there and once she went she kind of fell in love with hawaii i think she would have preferred to end up there instead of new york honestly um but that's not what happened um it's interesting she did also you know she wrote about a book about miami she spent a lot of time in miami which i lived in miami as well um, and then she wrote a book about El Salvador. These were um, things that she wrote about for New the New York Review of Books. They were long stories that then became books. She, what she did not write about was Europe. <laughs> um, she didn't really write about the Midwest. She was very interested in the South. She did travel in the South and in her notes from that, those travels appeared decades later in a book called South and West. Um, she was very interested in America and the United States, as well as, um, I would say, like the global South. She was interested in Central America um, and then the Pacific Rim, uh, Hawaii and, and you know, Vietnam and, and democracy takes place in sort of around the, the Pacific Rim. So she had, she, and so her point of view was still from, you know, California points West as the, she and John had a call column and Saturday evening post together that was called points west that th th they alternated who who wrote it um yeah so that was always her her point of view and let me just and she was so good at describing place um I think let me just read um since you are in San Francisco I'll just read a, one paragraph um from the building section um <clears throat> so San Francisco job hunt was a multi-page reported feature. And this was an article that she wrote for Mademoiselle magazine while she was in New York, while she was working for Vogue. She was she freelanced um, for Mademoiselle. Um, it was a multi-page multi reported feature that seemed to be intended as a self-help slash travel piece for young women interested in the West Coast. But Didion turned it into an investigation of gender inequity. The writer may have later distanced herself from the women's movement, 
But at age 25, she had no delusions about the reality of sexism. The article quotes an editor who admits that his newspaper hasn't hired a woman in four years, except for one society editor. In advertising, quote, they say that raises come in frequently and transfers to non-secretarial jobs about as often as a major earthquake, Didion wrote. The whole long article reads like an externalization of the writer's internal argument about why she should remain on the East Coast rather than live closer to her roots. Still, she can't help but rhapsodize about that ocean breeze. Quote, the feeling of the city is in its air, improbably clean, smelling of the Pacific. So I just love that way. Like she actually wrote a lot about smells. That, that way that she's just able to really capture an environment by like the feeling of the air, of the Pacific in the air. Um, I think you can still, it's probably the air is probably not impossibly clean in Sac San Francisco anymore, though I think there is, you know, something about its proximity to the ocean, the bay, that there is a way in which um, it, there's something specific. I'm sure you, you know, you feel it there. Uh, yeah. It's the air, it's the fog, it's, it's the, it's the, it's the movement of both land, sea, and air that is just a, it's a continual change. Right, right. You know, and she very famously wrote about the Santa Ana winds too, right? Um, in, in, uh, LA, LA notebook, which are, you know, I hear are about to descend. And again, just like her being able to like understand, like the feeling of the physical feeling of, of an environment, um, I think is really special. Really, really powerful. I mean, you were, you were talking about her her work and her also her work as an essayist, which she it it allowed her to go into so many different directions and different topics. But she also wrote that the essay can limit and distort reality, and that narrative was her expertise, but also her enemy. Um, so was she was she talking about how you know, can can codifying a topic also be limiting her point of view uh, in some way? And also, can you, can you give us an example of the things where she was a success hitting the mark or maybe missing the mark? You know, right. maybe her point of view was too limited. Right, right. So, you know, narrative is an ordering of, of chaos, right? It's trying to find a story in, in everything that happens in the world. And so whenever you... Whenever you, you know, we tell ourselves stories in order to live, but in order to tell the story, you're choosing the things that you're going to tell, right? And, you know, stories are can also be lies. I mean, one of her most famous uh, articles was political fictions, right? Like really understanding the lies that politicians tell us. And, you know, people like Dick Cheney and Ronald Reagan, she was very ruthless and <laughs> talking about um, and very on the mark and, and, um, talking about uh, the lot, the stories that they were telling us. Um, and so, you know, I think she was very aware of this in, in herself as well. And, and um, so, yes, she could, she could hit the mark and she could mi miss the mark too. Um, and I think sometimes she did both uh, in this, in the same essays. So um, I mentioned before some dreamers, of the golden dream was the, essay that the, this really it's not an essay it's really a reported story um it's a it's a crime story it's about a murder um in in the inland empire um in san bernardino uh and it's a very dark portrait of suburban california america so it's and it's really that's part of like her saying hey you know here's the golden dream and it's a it's a woman killing her husband um very, you know, other people I've talked to, that was the story that brought them to her writing. It's, it's so powerfully written and it, it's so out of conventional narrative form, out of journalistic form. Um, and it tells the story of California that's not just about beach culture or just about Hollywood or even Westerns, right? It tells um, a, a real person's story. And, um, you know, on, on the other hand, there have been critiques of that story that, that have come out from other writers, um, Susan Strait in particular in the LA Times, 
has said that, you know, who grew up in the towns that Joan was writing about and said she didn't see herself in, in that San Bernardino at all. Um, and that wasn't her story as um, the daughter of an immigrant herself, um, that Joan saw a very white world often um, and was not, didn't understand the complexity of, you know, of what Amer of what California was becoming. I do think like she failed to understand what the complexity of what it had been um, and what it was becoming. She, um, another example of that would be from her great essay, another really great essay called um, Notes from a Native Daughter, and slouching towards Bethlehem, um, which is one of the ones which she just really powerfully talks about what it means to be from California. She has, you know, this great passage in it. Um, if I can make you understand, wait, in fact, that is what I want to tell you about, what it is like to come from a place like Sacramento. If I can make you understand that, I can make you understand California and perhaps something else besides, for Sacramento is California, and California is a place in which a boom mentality and a sense of Chekhovian loss meet an uneasy suspicion, in which the mind is troubled by some buried by ineradicable, ineradicable suspicion that things had better work here, because here, beneath the immense bleached sky, is where we run out of continent. Right? It's like, great passage like nails so many things you know that uneasy tension between the past and and the future you know mike davis you know years later would talk in city of courts about the california boosters and california noir and that you know she she talks about it right you know in this passage from like it's like 1967 i think um you know the that uh uh what does she call it the uh, Chekhovian um, mentality, the boom mentality and Chekhovian loss, right? Um, and yet in this essay, her story of California starts with the settlers, starts with the gold rush. Like she really, she never really writes about the indigenous people or the Californios or the Spaniards who, you know, um, settled California before it became part of the United States. Like there, she misses a lot of that complexity. Um, she does come from a very white privileged position and she, it, it, it blinded her. On the other hand, she had so many insights and she was a groundbreaker in terms of her journalism, um, also groundbreaking for women writers and also, um, for exposing politics during the 60s and 70s. Um, just from your point of view and from what you've read, did she have, did, did she, what was her most important political writing, either that she discussed herself or from your observations? Right. So actually, I, I think, you know, it was really in the 80s and 90s that she really oh. delved into, I mean, she did, I mean, she was talking, she's talking about politics when she's writing about Hay Ashbury in, in 1967 because she's, you know, critiquing the counterculture, right? Um, so in a sense that is talking about politics, but, um, and, you know, she uh, interviewing Eldridge Cleaver in, in the 60s, I mean, you know, but she really became a political commentator and analyst in the 80s and 90s when mostly in her writing for the New York Review of, of Books. And I have a whole chapter about this called, called Jogger and it's called Jogger, um, because, you know, one of the great pieces that she wrote was Sentimental Journeys, which was about the New York Central Park um, a jogger a assault and the young men who were railroaded and convict falsely convicted in that case. And, you know, she wrote about this the year of their conviction, um, not decades later when filmmakers have picked it up again and, you know, and they've since been, you know, exonerated, right? And, and someone else was admitted to having... Um, assaulted the jogger. Um, she was writing about Miami, writing about El Salvador, um, that these became books. And, you know, writing about politicians, she covered the campaign trail um, and wrote, that was political fictions, just um, 
really analyzing the narrative of political discourse and how alienated it was from the people of the United States. Um, so that that's really crucial work. Not not necessarily as famous as you know her coverage of the '60s, her coverage of rock stars, or her later work writing about her loss of her husband and and her daughter. But this was the you know some of the most award winning and and consequential work. Yeah, you know um, earlier I have been describing to you about rereading the essay on the women's movement from 1972 and how it's just a very difficult piece of writing. And I wondered if you would talk about how she was so critical of the feminist movement, but, you know, she was a feminist in her own right. She she lived her life without compromise, without excuse. And also she had very, you know, very strong lifelong friendships with women, um, you know, including writers Jean Stein and Nora Ephraim. And I wondered if you could talk about this, this, sort of uh, this antagonistic relationship with, with feminism or not. <laughs> well, see, this this is where my writing about music um, and writing about Joan Tidian really do come together because I'm so used to this from writing about really strong, iconic, groundbreaking musicians who, you know, will not come anywhere near the word feminist, don't want to associate themselves or, or, you know, are very reluctant, you know, and 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 I've come to understand it um, because they don't want to paint themselves in a box. They don't want labels. They they and you know and it's also not a question we you know it's not something we make men identify themselves as feminists or not. You know, um, so it's not fair that it's a box that we make women check off, but but not not men. Um, so I get that with Joan, and if she didn't, you know, and but she also. She wrote, a, as you said, a piece called The Women's Movement, in which she did kind of throw her sisters under um, the, the wagon a little bit uh, and critiqued the women's movement. Now, I will say that a lot of the things that she said are now common critiques of second wave feminism. So um, she wasn't necessarily wrong. It just maybe wasn't um, the most sympathetic way to go about um analyzing the problems that that feminism was encountering right she, she could have done it in a in a in, in a more comprehensible a fashion um and maybe more sisterly but you know to me what's what's more important is that she lived a life that modeled how to be a woman um that took risks and spoke for herself and and spoke for other women um and that she wrote constantly about women's lives from that piece in uh, in Mademoiselle about you know which was supposed to be a travel piece about San Francisco and she ends up exposing the, the sexism of the media industry there um you know to uh all of her novels have women characters as their protagonists um so you know she didn't call herself a conservative she didn't call herself a liberal she didn't call herself a you know um, she doesn't have to call herself a feminist. I can still see her as a, a powerful woman who, you know, changed my life and changed many women's lives. Yeah. Well, she's certainly been a great influence to to us. And, you know, with her writing and her essays, I mean, her five novels, I mean, she she and, and her husband, John, had written, I didn't realize it was five screenplays uh not to mention well, those are the ones that got produced, <laughs> they they got did. produced exactly yeah so, i mean you know her her the, the vastness of her work is is so amazing and you know we have you to also thank for all of the points of view that you've brought to us in your book but i'd like to open this up to our audience we have a couple questions and um, andy would you like to um read those out to us and and uh, we'll have uh, some responses. Absolutely. I'll start with a question, um, which uh, I know has been gone over a bit, but we'll ask again, how did your experience writing about Joan Didion differ from your experience writing about women in the music industry? Um, well, I mean, Joan's, but that's, this is sound wrong, but of course, Joan's very articulate. She was a writer. So it was, you know, she, she, and she, 
wrote a lot about herself. So she explained herself very well. Um, you know, not all musicians, a lot of musicians, they don't want to articulate what their songs are about because they don't, um, they want the listener to decide um, or because they they don't really know, right? Sometimes it's a mystery process, mystery for them, right? Or they don't want to diffuse the mystery. Um, so, you know, Joan had, had, you know, wrote so much about writing, wrote so much about her own life um, that that made it easy. Um, I would say that was the the main difference, and you know, and then the yeah, like you know, there were the similarities of um, not wanting to identify as as a feminist. Um, Joan, you know, Joan wrote with a lot of transparency. She also had her secrets, and you know, some of those I. I didn't pry open and you know some of them I, I poke around a little bit um she's also no longer with us sadly and most of the musicians that I've written about are are still with us so that's also very different what you know what you can say what you are willing to say right our next question um asks for Evelyn is if um asked did you see the Joan Didion exhibit at the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles and do you have thoughts on that yes I did see it I saw it I think three times I took a I had was teaching a literary journalism class so I took my students to see it I wrote about it from High Country News if you you can google that and find out in depth what I thought I actually thought it was really interesting it was you know curated um by Hilton Allison and a, a curator at, at the Hammer. And it's now in Miami, actually. So I'm going to go see it again in a couple of weeks. I'm going to be in Miami and I'm going to give a little tour of it, as a matter of fact. Um, I, I I actually thought it was really interesting. Um, you know, it's it's a weird, my students were confused. Some of my students were confused by it because they, um, it's, it's basically, you know, Hilton's, um, now impressions of different works that reflect themes in Joan's work. Um, it's not, you know, it's, she did um, okay it. She was aware that it was happening, um, but she, you know, she passed, you know, two years before it opened. Um, so she, she didn't know most of what was in it. She had a general sense. Um, I, I, I actually thought it was really thoughtful and um, I, he went on a tour that he gave of it and you know he also says like you know where I was from is the you know the touchstone and the importance of sentimental journeys like I thought he hit a lot of the right right notes in it in a in an interesting evocative fashion um yeah if you have the chance to go to Miami and see it um it's it you have to understand that there are photos of Joan in it some and there are some artifacts, but it's mostly artwork by artists that maybe Joan knew, maybe Joan liked, but it, maybe maybe just Hilton feeling like this evoked something about Joan. Our next question um, comes from an attendee asking, um, if Joan Didion, or if you know anything about Joan Didion's relationship um, to Chinese American history or culture, and they share an anecdote of uh, when I ushered for one of her talks at the Norse Auditorium during the rehearsal, they promised that if she signed everyone's book afterwards, they would take her to Samuel Restaurant to eat and named her favorite dishes there. Interesting. Yeah, this is actually really interesting because I was just in Sacramento last week and I, I wrote the, the River Roads um, from Berkeley to Sacramento, which I highly recommend along the Delta. It's just such a beautiful, interesting, and that she wrote, you know, so much about that. Um, and, you know, if you've seen Lady Bird driving over those bridges in the movie. Um, uh, and, you know, there is a, a lot of um, Chinese restaurants there because there were many um, Chinese laborers in, in the fields. Um, and 
there was a presence. And actually when I stayed in, I stayed in, um, a, it was called the, the Wong mansion that was built by, I was told it was a Chinese diplomat. And I was told it was a doctor. So I'm not exactly sure which is the correct story. Um, but there was also, I mean, this is the time of a lot of anti-Asian sentiment um, in, in the thirties, when this mansion was built, when Joan was born, um, she didn't not write hardly at all about Asian Americans that I know of, but she was, um, I know she was a big fan of Maxine Han Kingston, um, and worked to support her career, um, and saw her as a really important writer of, about, California and about America. And I, you know, and I think part of her interest in the Pacific Rim um, and in Hawaii is because she was also, again, interested in those cultures. Um, I did find it's in the book. Um, I was going through her grandparents' papers um, and they were part of the, um, gold, the um, Native Sons and Native Daughters of the Golden West, which is a kind of Shriners of California dedicated to um, memorializing that glorious uh, um, 19th century past of um, America and I mean of California in the gold rush. And I, and I found an old pamphlet from like 1935 that had explicit anti-Asian um, racism in it about like one of the goals of the organization is to um, not let the Asian American quota be expanded because we can't let them take over. It's really horrible. Now this isn't, this is Joan's grandparents who she did not like and she spoke, um, wrote poorly of, um, but very important figures in Sacramento history. Genevieve Didion was on the school board for decades and there's a school named after her. Um, so I, that's a really, I, I, I love that anecdote and I'd, I'd like to find out more about it because I do think that she was very sympathetic and, you know, she also, you know, she did write beautifully about Mexican culture, but not as much as she, she could have. She wasn't unaware of, of these things. And I think in a way she was trying to be like, well, well, it's not really my place to tell these stories, but let's, you know, Maxine Hound Kingston needs to tell these stories and we need to listen to her tell these stories so um she probably would have gotten critiqued if she had tried maybe because uh i mean miriam gerba has you know leveled some very strong you know strong and correct criticisms of joan didion but i think she also you know doesn't want wouldn't have wanted joan didion to write american dirty either so i'm so glad to hear about this connection between joan and maxine hong kingston because we are great fans of maxine and we're 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 close. We're close friends. She's been to mechanics many times, and we we do adore her. It's interesting. Um, before we close out, um, Evelyn, I just wanted to know if there, through all of your work and writing about Joan Didion, was there something about her family life and or her life as a writer that surprised you along the way? Yeah, I think that. Um finding things like her letters, some letters to Maxine that are in Ma Maxine's papers at um, at the Bancroft Library in, in Berkeley, um, uh, as just in letters in general that she wrote that I found in different collections or that people shared with me that were really just so warm and personal and just such lovely letters. And we do, you know, there is, there's this kind of like, there's something scary about her. Um, Joan, you know, she could be a very withering critic. Um, you know, uh, the sunglasses, right? Um, and so to see that warmth that came out in those personal letters and also the people that I talked to that knew her family members, friends, colleagues, uh, spoke to that side of her. Um, I, that I never saw, I never, you know, met her. I, I didn't have those kinds of personal interactions. Um, but I, I, I mean, I have next to my, me here, um, a picture, I don't know if you can see it very well, um, but it's flowers that she pressed in a frame. It's a, um, Griffin Dunn, her nephew, um, this took a photo and sent it to me. So this is a printout of a photo of a, of a print. Um, but she would do this for people. She would press flowers. This is her and her daughter did this together um, and give these to people, which is just, you know, a very, again, she loved 
as much as she was afraid of snakes, she loved flowers. And that was the side of her that I um, wanted to honor. And I focus on that at the end of the book. That's great. Well, Evelyn McDonald, I want to just thank you for your insights and your perspectives of Joan Didion in this amazing book, The World Accordion, According to Joan Didion. And I do recommend everyone uh, pick up a copy at your local bookstore. Um, we'll put book passage in our link. And also, I want to also say uh, this has just been a great introduction and an opening to Joan's work and also to your to your work as well. Um, and once again, you know, join us in San Francisco uh, for your next book tour. And we look forward to meeting you here in person. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. I hope to come there myself as well. Great. And thanks everyone for joining us and we'll see you either online or in person at Mechanics Institute. Thanks again.